welcome to the Litigation Psychology Podcast, brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. Dr. Steve Wood, joining me, Dr. Bill Kanaski. How are you? Happy New Happy Year to New you. Happy New Year. Happy yeah. New Year, 2024. I gotta say, 23, pretty, pretty, pretty solid. Uh, we kicked ass uh, at Courtroom Sciences. Uh, we um, had uh, a lot of positive things happen and um for both of us and uh and for the company as a whole uh we we we, we got uh some really amazing results for uh for clients and uh gus got got many many new cl uh clients in, in in 23 podcast rocking for, for the first time in many years like i don't have a rant about about the year before i i'm actually very thumbs up on uh uh, the way 2023 went, and I'm looking forward to 24. What's your thoughts on this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, 2023 was good, like you said, for me professionally, for us, you and I, and for the, for the company. Met met a lot of cool people, nice people, great, yes. you know, uh, great presentations we gave, new clients, great clients, got a lot of good feedback on the podcast, new listeners on the podcast. So, yeah, I, zero, zero complaints for me. It is, it is rocking. And you know, and we're going to start off this year. This is our first episode of the year and it's our favorite thing to do. Viewer list or listener mail. Yeah. And so I, I collect these, you know, I just collect these and put them in a, in a file and then we bring them out every, you know, couple months. Uh, some of these are from emails. A lot of these are from uh, post speech uh, conversations I've had with attorneys or, or clients um, so I, I got a style list. I know you have a, a couple as well. I'm going to tell you some of some of these questions are a little bit off the wall, but we have we have you know we have people that um, that listen to this podcast that come up to me after a speech like, hey, I listened to the podcast and they start asking questions. So I, I've I, I've got a, I've got a solid list here. Excellent. Um, well, let's let's start it then. Let fire away. We're gonna jump right. We're gonna jump right in, and I think this is. I, I think this could be the one of the most important uh, qu questions in the listener slash viewer mail. Here is uh, this is from a defense attorney. Um, how can I deal with anchoring by plaintiffs' counsel? Now, we've talked about anchoring before. Uh, it is a very powerful um, uh, phenomenon, um, and we and mostly what we've talked about is um you, you got to know it's coming you got to know what it is right and the plans council is going to set that anchor right uh they could they, they depending on what venue you know they could do it in jury selection but they're definitely going to do an opening statement and they're certainly going to repeat it in uh closing argument and we've talked about you know in the vast majority of cases is you need to give a number to counter anchor right we've right. We've, we've we've discussed all this However, what I had told this, 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 this was a question that, that I've gotten a couple of times, but uh, I was talking to a, uh, uh, a defense attorney after a speech. And I said, the way the way you really deal with this countering or I'm sorry, this um, anchoring issue. Is in jury selection. OK, so 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 try to follow me here. So what you do in jury selection, okay, if you really want to poison the well and torpedo the whole anchoring issue right is during voir dire you ask the jury you say uh ladies and gentlemen right and this, this is not the first question obviously you're gonna work up to this has anybody here heard, ready for, watch what i'm doing has anybody here heard about the concept of anchoring now somebody may have hold their hand right now here's here's the example you use yeah yeah for example for example we've all applied for jobs right we've all negotiated a a salary, right? Compensation. And say you want to make, you want a hundred thousand. Let's just use a round number. You want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, you may have asked for 125. Knowing that you want to be at a hundred, you asked for 125, knowing that you know they would they would probably counter on you, right? And you end up someplace in the middle. That's a classic example of anchoring. Does everybody here know what I'm talking about? Now everybody on everybody in the whole room is going to know what anchoring is. Then, <laughs> essentially, depending on how ballsy you are, is you say, "I expect plaintiffs' counsel is going to do the same exact thing in opening and closing uh, 
with his or her uh, damages amount. Now, you know, and, and so now you're, you're really just indoctrinating them to what's coming up. You can ask a couple other follow-up questions. I think that's a great way to deal with anchoring. And here's the other thing, because remember, there's like the, 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 every, every action has a counter. Um, every action has a reaction, right? You, so you're, you're going to try to expose this anchoring. Now, don't forget, the other side of this is lowballing. Right. That's right. right? So it, it's a great time to also say, now, this is all jury selection. You're programming the jurors, pre-programming them for what they're going to hear and to hear it your way. And you say, I am going to give, <laughs> right, a counter to their damages number. I'm not admitting liability. Right. You say that up front. And some people may consider that something called low. It, does anybody know what lowballing is, right? Everybody's going to know what lowballing is, right? Most people. And you maybe give another example. The purpose being do that in voir dire, okay? And get this topic going. Because here's the thing. When plaintiff's counsel stands up and starts talking about money, you've, you've torpedoed that with the education on anchoring and jury selection. Wait, yeah, it's a good it's a good idea. And I think the only, you know, when you talk about lowballing, the only thing is there is you need to be at least cognizant of what your counter anchor is. I think too often when we do these types of things and people are talking about counter anchoring, there's not much thought into what they're doing. And then when you do lowballing, it usually is perceived as lowballing because you have such a disparity between what the plaintiff's asking and what the defense is asking. Hence the reason to focus group your case. Bingo. <laughs> if you're That's going listen, I'm just, and, and by the way. We have all kinds of options for focus grouping and stuff like that, okay? We won't get into the specifics of that. But if you are going to trial, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to trial and you're not doing some form, now again, you may have a $100 million case. Well, you may do multiple focus, right? You may have a $5 million case, right? But I'm still saying you should do a focus group on that. You may, may The scope may be different. If you're not testing your counter anchor you're gonna you're you're in big big trouble because that's where the risk of the perception of low blind. all the great verdicts that i've been a part of right particularly when we we know we're going to get hit but we need to know what's the best counter so hey we don't want to piss this jury off right, right? but we don't want to counter too high because then we're wasting money you test that in the focus group model so you know where your sweet spot is OK, because if you just go in the courtroom cold and the plaintiff attorney asks for 50 million dollars and you come back with 800,000 because you think that's what it's worth. But you haven't tested that. Many jurors can be like, are you out of your are you out of your effing mind? Right. That's crazy. Right. Now, if you've done your research and you know, wow, you know, anything under two million dollars really ticked this jury off. But when we when we repeated the study and we we countered with, you know, three or four or something like, like we know where our sweet spot is that has worked every time in my career by testing it. So you can be very confident in the number that you are putting in front of the jury. Cause you, 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 you tested it. And I think, you know, going back to, you talk about testing it, you don't think plaintiff's attorneys have been testing their amounts. I mean, I know that they, they, they test exactly it. How high can do. I, how I mean, high can I go? How high can I go without making jurors mad, but how yes. low can I go to not get my client enough? Yes. And we've, I've been told for 20 years as well, my client won't pay for jury research, blah, blah, blah. Well, we've come out with some new stuff that is extraordinarily cost effective. I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. So if you don't think you can afford it, you're going to be shocked because you actually can. So call Steve and I and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you about that privately. And I think the other thing we want to talk about on, on counter anchoring too, is you can't just, and when you throw out your numbers, it has to have some justification behind it. You have to be able to look at, yeah, you know, the, the life care plan and say, here, this is excessive. This is not needed. Sure. This is here's what's rational. Here's what's reasonable. But to just go out there and say they're asking for too much money, we think it should be less, and then move on. Jurors exactly. are going to say it doesn't make any sense to me. You, that's just you lowballing, or that's you just trying to drive exactly. the number down. But if you can articulate why <laughs> it's that much, because most of the time plaintiff attorneys don't, because especially when you're talking about pain and suffering and all these other things that don't have any sort of standard, they end up pulling these wild ranges that they use in order to say, well, let's give them $500 a day for the next 20 years. And that's going to be X amount of money. Exactly. So 
do your homework before you start, you know, going, going to trial and throwing these, throwing these, um, numbers out there. Um, next question. Okay. This is our first off the wall question. Legitimate question in 2024, Steve, you ready? I'm ready. I'm going to direct this one to you. Then I'm going to comment on afterwards. Is <laughs> this actually comes up more, more than I'd like to admit. Um, is it okay if my witness wears her nose ring to her video deposition? Uh, that's a hard no. <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, in those situations, you have to understand that jurors will, and even, even mediators and all these other people will make snap decisions. You know, I've talked about on the podcast before about the concept of thin slicing, where you take small snippets of information and formulate opinions of people based upon very, very small you know, pictures, videos, all that type of stuff. So I would say no, because, you know, like I said, that might be their thing. That might be the way that they, they uh, portray themselves. But the truth of the matter is you don't want that in a deposition because you don't want it to distract. Yeah. I think in most instances, you're, you're right. My first question was, well, what, what type of nose ring are we talking about? <laughs> I've seen some nose rings, like the right. one going through the septum. That's like yeah. the, it looks when like you the said that, that's exactly what I yeah. thought. I didn't. Yeah. Now, I did have a case where we let this slide where um, it was a former employee. So to, to get her to just participate in debt prep was a miracle. And we didn't want to piss her off. And it was one of those nose rings kind of like right there on the corner. It was very, very like you you almost couldn't see it. Okay. Like you almost had to really, really look. And we had gotten her so far. We're like, let you know, let's just let it go. And it was kind of in a... um how can I say this without, you know, epically pissing everybody off? It was in a venue that was fairly liberal and it, it like it was like put this this way. Most of the jurors had nose rings. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yeah. It didn't really make a difference. And her her um, position in the company at the time was not one of like she wasn't an executive. So we kind of let that one go. But I'd say, yeah, in most instances, I'd say convince them to get rid of it. It's not going to do any good. Uh, and if they have the bull ring one right in the front of the septum, that's, I don't think that's ever going to go. go no, yeah. And when, you, like I said, when you said that, that's all I was anticipating was, was that coming in. But no, I think to your point, um, each situation is different, but 99% of the time, but I hear what you're saying. If you need to do it in order to keep your relationship with, with the witness to get the witness to cooperate. And if that's what they want, then yeah, so be it. Yeah. Uh, next, next question, which is highly related to this. Um, I'm going to let you start with this. Um, my witness uh, has uh, my witness was terminated after the incident, but I still need to present him at death. I called him to tell him uh, that I was his attorney and that he wouldn't have to pay for everything. And I was looking forward to his prep. He hung up and told me to go F myself. What should I do? Hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, I. I the... That's a, that's a tough one. What do you do? I mean, to your point is there's not, I mean, you can't necessarily coerce them to get in, to come in and, and work with you or whatever. And you have to understand, like you said, we've said before, the terminated client is one of the most difficult ones uh, to work with. You know, I guess in that situation, w what I would recommend is you, you got to start off small with them, meaning yeah, it has small. to be like, it has to be like a, like a, a, a relationship where you warm them up to the process, get them yeah. to understand yeah. what you are, what your goal is and stuff like that versus, Hey, you're in this lawsuit. I want to, I want you to come in so that I can meet with you. You know, yeah. most people wouldn't want a phone call from an attorney out of the clear blue. Yeah. And, and, um, in many cases I had one of these, um, um, and I think is the case in this one is, uh, they're named, they're individually named. So yeah, I, I think reaching out, um, well, first of all, the way you fix the first. Yeah. So you want to reach out in, in, in a far more soft, caring yeah. way. <laughs> Number one, to say, hey, there's this lawsuit. Hey, I'm here to help you. I'm on your team. You're not paying a nickel. And hey, listen, I want to I want to protect you. I know this is stressful. Um, you know, How are you doing with the, right? Be more the therapist before you're the attorney. Right? right. Here, here, you've already pissed the dude off. Right. And he told you to F off. No, it was go F yourself, right? Distinct difference there, but there is a difference. Um, I would say F off. I say go F yourself is a little bit more powerful than F off, but you know, to, to each his own. Um, yeah, I, I would send, I, I would, I would re I would reach out again. I, I would apologize. Yeah. Is what I, would, I would say, listen, 
Yeah, I, I came, you know, listen, uh, sorry that I reached out and kind of jumped right into business. I should have asked you, hey, how are you today? How are you doing? Um, you know, you're part of this lawsuit. Um, listen, yeah, I'm one of the good guys. I'm here to help you. Um, um, how is it, has this been impacting you? How, you know, how are your stress levels? Are you, obviously you're a little bit angry. Let, let, you know, let's, let's talk about that. I, I want to help you through this. That's one of the things I want to do. I'm not just going to be a lawyer here. I, I, I need to be, you know, I need to be here for you as a, as a, as a support, you know, and everything you tell me is privileged and confidential and, and let this person vent. Let, yeah. let this person call everybody names and just get all that emotion out. But I do think you have a do over opportunity. I think, I think that's a good way to go. Yeah. And I, and I think when you say being, being a name defendant, it brings up another, you know, problem too, where, like you said, wanting to get them to understand that too, to say, Hey, you're a name defendant in this case and kind of let them yeah. know what the implications are and say, Hey, like you said, I'm on your side. I'm here to prevent any sort of damage to you. So I want to make sure, like you said, just getting them to know that they're there. Because I think one of the things we talk about too often is that witnesses get the feeling that the only reason why the attorney is reaching out to them is because they want to cover the the the, the, the main company. Yeah. And you, and you think witnesses aren't smart enough to know that, to say, the only reason why you're even reaching out to me is because you don't want the company to get hit. You don't care about yeah. me. You don't care you about me. my well-being. You don't care about whether I'm ready for, you just want to make sure your client doesn't get hit. So the, the fact that you don't think that they're aware of that. So I think, like you said, <laughs> to your tact, I think would help get them more comfortable, get them more understanding. Because once again, most people don't like to deal with attorneys, even it's, even witnesses, when we get ready to prep them who are willing to do it, talk about how stressful yeah. it is when they get calls and emails from their attorneys. And I think that's one of the things that, that gets lost is the stress that that they get yeah. once they get an yeah. email or a call. I know. Uh, attorneys always tell me, like, God, they did so... There's so much better since I've got you involved. I wonder why. I'm like, because I because I, I show concern for them. Yeah. I show empathy. I don't just jump right into the damn case. So right. develop some rapport, uh, folks. Absolutely. With any not just with, with with any witness. I think you really need to attorneys need to work more on developing rapport, showing some empathy, and 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 asking these witnesses, you know, you know how are they doing as a person? And, and we, what, we've, what we've already covered a million times is many of these people have other shit going on in their life that's stressing them the hell out. Yeah. You, and you need to be able to let them vent about that stuff and get that up. You're going to develop more rapport, which leads to more trust, which leads to more openness, which leads to more motivation to help you and to be prepared, which leads to better outcomes. Which one thing I want to do close up on that too, is that takes time, right? I think one of the times we, we get always, why is this going to take six to eight hours? Yeah, well, it takes six to eight hours because the first couple hours needs to be rapport building or you should have yeah. already done it before. Yeah. So don't be, yeah. don't, don't rush the process, I guess. Don't rush the process. You have a couple of questions, Steve. Yeah. One, one of the questions I have for you that I, I keep getting often is, you know, when witnesses say, I don't know in a deposition, you know, attorneys will say, well, does it sound bad? Or even the witness will say, does it sound bad that I don't know the answer to the question? Should I know the answer to the question? So what would you say in that situation about witnesses saying, I don't know, problematic, good, bad? Well, it really depends on who the witness is and what their role is, right? So, for example, if it's a medical malpractice case and the question is to the surgeon who performed the procedure and there's a bunch of I don't knows, that looks pretty damn bad, right? Right. Versus, you're right, if it's an ancillary witness, right, or say it's the nurse in that case, and they're asking the nurse stuff that maybe that nurse really shouldn't know because she's he or she's not a physician, right? Um, then it's, it's completely um, uh, uh, appropriate. So I think it really needs to match. Well, first off, we always tell witnesses, hey, listen, you got to tell the truth. And if I don't know is the truth, then that's what you go with. Number one. Number two, there are certain things you don't want your witnesses to know. Like, you know, they're asking the nurse questions about the, the surgeon. You want the answer to be, hey, I don't know. Ask the surgeon, right? And vice versa. They're asking the surgeon questions about the nurse. You want the surgeon saying, I don't know. You'd have to ask the nurse. I'm not a nurse. So there, there are where I don't knows are really, really effective and really important. 
but if it comes across as a perception of lack of preparation, you don't have your shit together, you haven't reviewed the medical record in a med mal case or something like that, you know, that's, I, I think that that can be a problem. So I think it's going to be on a case by case, witness by witness basis. And then the clear differentiation between I don't know and I don't remember. Right. right? Meaning, I don't remember, right? I, it's a memory issue versus a a knowledge issue. Those are those are two, you know. I, I many witnesses don't remember things because you know the case is from 2017, right? I just worked on a case this week, the the uh, a trucking uh, case. Um, you know, the accident's from 2017, and COVID got in the way, and then the case got bumped and bumped and bumped. And you're asking witnesses about shit that happened six years ago, six and a half years ago. That that's that's pretty tough. So that's another example. Whereas I've worked on a couple of cases where the you know depths are coming up and the case is not even like maybe a year old, and and they're fast tracking it. Well, now and I don't remember when you're talking about something from maybe a year ago, right? So I think it's really going to be uh, on a case by case basis what that yeah. witness's role is and, 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 and kind of what the situation is um, with their answers. And the reason why I bring that up is, you know, I've been hearing lately that, you know, opposing counsel, a lot of times will we'll get the, I don't know, and actually use the, I don't know, like you said, is ammunition to say they don't, why won't they know this? But going back to the point where they know other people know the nuance of this, this event happened in 2017. It's now 2023. There's somehow this expectation that they're supposed to know and yeah. it always amazes me, though, that that jurors will at sometimes hold people accountable for that and say, how do they not know? How do they how do they not remember that? It was a traumatic event. How do they not know every single piece of information? Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it does depend on um, like, and for example, here is let's kind of juxtapose two things here. Right. So let's say a, a, a health care case, a med mal case, right, surgery gone bad or whatever. And a. um uh, a transportation case where there's an accident on the on the interstate. Well, here's the thing. When the surgeon's doing the surgery, oftentimes the event doesn't happen until days later, right? Or is it, yeah, right? Post a post-op infection takes days. Right? So there wasn't any traumatic event at the time. It was a typical surgery, right? Whereas the the guy driving the 80,000 80, pound tractor trailer, right? The accident's the accident, right? And there could be dash cam video. Well, there is no dash cam video, right? Uh, example of a, of a surgery. So um, so there's, there's very different ways in which these events happen in which um, the perception of a memory, a lack of memory, I think can be taken, you know, several different ways. Yeah, if you... Um, I mean, I, I was there for the birth of my two children and, and yeah, I, I remember both of them. Right. Yeah. I was there. Um, and I know there's been times, um, you know, when my kids were be between the ages of, you know, two and five. Yeah. They got sick. They got really sick right now, Steve. I, I could not, I, I don't remember one of those times. I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, that was 10, 15 right? 17 years ago, depending on which of my kids, I, I don't have them. Like, I know they were, they've been sick as when they were really young, right? I, I don't really remember those specific illnesses, but I remember when uh, Billy broke his arm in the basketball game, right? And I rushed him to the ER and then he had to have, sir I remember that. So yeah, I think it's based on what they're being asked to remember. Um, I, I think, you know, the expectation is going to be based on, you know, what it is, how long ago it was, how significant uh, it was. And then, you know, these witnesses also oftentimes do have materials, exhibits, for example, the medical record in a medical case that may help them with their memory or the dash cam video in the trucking case. But see, sometimes you have cases where there's none of that. There is none of that. And so it's a 100% reliance on memory. And we know that memory is notoriously flawed. And so again, it, it, it's a tricky issue that again is gonna be varied on case to case. I do think the explanation of why a witness doesn't remember something. You know, why don't you know? Or, yeah, Cause often, oftentimes we'll say, I don't know, I don't remember. 
the follow-up question at that position sometimes is, well, why, why don't you? And sometimes the very simple answer is because it was seven years ago. Right. Right. <laughs> or, you know, there was nothing about you know, for the physician, right? There was nothing about that surgery at the time that was abnormal. Um, it may very well make you perfect sense. And if you end up in trial and there's a bunch of I don't knows that weren't follow up down from the depth and say during adverse examination, those come up, then defense counsel needs to ask the witness, well, why don't you know the specifics? So they can look at the jury and say, hey, it was seven years ago, or that particular event was a kind of standard operating procedure. There was nothing really, uh, nothing unusual about it. Therefore, I don't have a specific recollection. So I think these can be worked with. Well, I think the other thing too, I wanted to touch on about why this comes up as well. And you kind of mentioned it like, you know, with 30B6s and an expectation to know certain things. But I mean, how many times have we seen where witnesses during the prep don't see documents and don't see things? So when yeah. they say, I don't know, it's something that they probably could have known had they had the time in prep. So I, the other point being is to your, you know, you had said some things they should know, some things you don't want them to know. But at the same time, I think attorneys could help eliminate some of the I don't knows by making sure whatever documents they know are going to be shown to yeah. them, they're familiar with them. So then they can Absolutely. speak to them. Then it helps to build their credibility to reduce the I don't knows. Yep. Because as we know, sometimes jurors will give witnesses a pass for saying, I don't know. And sometimes they won't. And a lot of times it goes to whether or not they're siding with the plaintiff or the defense. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we seen where someone's pro plaintiff, they hammer that witness for not knowing yeah. versus the pro defense jurors like, well, it was seven years ago. Let's give them a break. So you yeah. kind of try to reduce that by yeah. eliminating the, or and, and depending on your case, if you have a lot of those, uh, that's a voir dire topic. Yeah. Bring, you bring that up. You bring that up. And so they know what's coming. Right. And it, it happens. So and we sure as heck don't right. want them to speculate. Exactly. Speculation leads to a lot of trouble. Uh, next question. Um, I, I think this is very interesting. I think this is very interesting. I've been in the situation many of times. Um, I'm going to hand this off to you first. Is it better received by jurors if a female attorney cross-examines an adverse female witness versus a male doing it? Now, so so say you have a, a female plaintiff, right? I've had many of trial teams say, hey, I don't know if I want the male or male, you know, defense attorney up there hammering away. Maybe the jurors see that as a bully, you know, David versus Goliath. We may want to have our female attorney, right? And by the way, this I, we get the same question with race. Yeah, you know we have we have an Hispanic witness. Yeah, do we really want the white guy asking questions? Do we have an Hispanic uh, lawyer on the team? Maybe we should do that. It it's a really touchy situation. I do think it's a valid question. What are your thoughts? Um, my initial thought is, <laughs> I tend to I tend to like the female on on female because especially now kind of within the current climate that we're in with, you know, the Me Too movement and a lot of the other things that are going on. I just think you don't want to set yourself up for any sort of perception of, like you said, of bullying. And we saw how it played out, really go back to uh, uh, Amber Heard and, and Johnny Depp, where you saw the female, the female attorney cross-examined Amber Heard versus uh, the male yeah. attorney. So I, te I tend to like it, especially if you're talking about sensitive topics as well. I mean, I, I've worked on a case... Uh, involving sexual assault and now do you really want the male attorney cross-examining the, the victim yeah. um, i think that is a strategy but tend to me my my personal thought would be to to match yeah um here's well here's the other it always comes back down to this test your case folks yeah do that do that in a focus group and see what happens do it both ways in the focus group and see what happens that's what the plaintiffs do they focus group this shit do it in front of a focus group that's going to give you your ultimate answer because really when it comes to a steve you may not have a female attorney right. on your staff, on, on the team, to be available to do that. Or you may not have a Hispanic attorney to cross-examine a Hispanic. You, it may not be possible. To your point, testing it would definitely be a thing yeah. because a lot of times we think maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't matter. But you know, how many times have we heard where we, we hear from attorneys or clients that think race is going to matter or they think this yeah. is going to matter or that's going to matter and it ends up not mattering at all but being a non-issue so test your cases folks um all right this next question is just absolutely insane okay i'm, I'm not naming names um I, I actually hope this person does not listen to the podcast because they're they're gonna know it's them i've been hanging on 
on this question for about six months. So I've I've kind of waited on this. <laughs> this is an actual question. And this was hardly, this was in writing email. Up. I have I have cut and paste this. You ready? Yeah. Dear Bill, I am sick of practicing law. Can I come and work for you and be a jury consultant? I have lots of legal experiences and I think it would be a good fit for me. <clears throat> um, I did reply to the email. Um, I was very professional in my response. Um, th the answer is no, you cannot work for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you can't. Um, and the reason why is the um, is is that we, we I mean this is our philosophy of courtroom sciences. It's my personal flaw. I need people with advanced training in psychology. I don't need a lawyer. A, a lawyer is not going to help courtroom sciences. We right. actually had one of those before. That didn't work out too well. Again, no names. Uh, no, I, I don't need a lawyer. No, no, no. I, I need I need I need people with advanced training in psychology. I don't need. Um, I, I, if you've been trying cases for twenty years and you think you pick juries really well, go go start your own consulting firm. Don't I, I no, no. I don't want that. Th and that's the value that we bring. We're we're non lawyer. We're, you know, we're not lawyers, right? I mean, if a well, and we, we do have competitors that are lawyers, which we shall not name. Uh, that prep witnesses, um, which is which is almost hilarious at this point. Um, they love the pivot. We'll, we'll leave it at that. You guys can figure it out. But if you're in a, like, what value are you bringing a legal team? If you're like, I'm an attorney and I can also be your consultant. No, you, you already have attorneys, right? And that's why people call you and I, that's why attorneys call you and I is because we're not attorneys. Right. We, we bring a skill set that has nothing to do with law. I have zero legal training. Neither do you. I don't want any legal training. Um, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't think. Um, again, our field's unregulated. You could, you know, you can be an attorney and be an, a consultant. I just don't, what are your thoughts on it? It's no, kind of I, it I think, an awkward question that caught me off guard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, there are obviously some, some attorneys out there that do this. Um, but I think to your point, that's why I like to do it, you know, is because we don't have legal training and it allows us to defer to the attorneys. Cause I think one of the things I always yeah. preach when I go in there is, Hey, I'm not coming in to do your job. I'm coming in to help do your job. Like I'm not coming in to take over. I'm coming in to help you do your job. You have the legal acumen. You have the legal experience. You're the attorney. I trust you on all those areas of law. And then and, and in return, just trust me on the psychological aspect. Trust me on the jury decision making aspect. And yeah. I think that's what helps make a nice relationship is we realize where each one's strengths are and I don't cross into theirs as they don't cross into mine. Yeah, this is, this is, separate so we'll we'll, we'll leave it at that um um by the way about five years ago i had a claims person from a major insurance company send me an email like can you talk i thought she was calling with a new case and i said hey how's it going and she's like um i hate this job i've been doing this for 20 years i really really like what you do it'd be awesome can i apply for a job with you and i'm like no <laughs> and she got mad well, you don't think I could? I'm like, no, you can't do it. No, yeah, go, yeah, go get a PhD in psychology and then, then call me. I'm like, no, you, no, no. You, this, you think this is easy? Well, I've handled X number of claims and I know how this system works. I'm like, no, it, no, it's just please, just please, stop. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's call, your rant. That's your rant to start. That's off my rant. That's my rant for the day. <laughs> um, I have a couple more here. Um, Okay, Steve, this is a great this is a great question. And I've seen people do I don't think this is a good idea. I'm gonna let but this is I want you to answer first, right? Okay. Uh plaintiff, I know plaintiff's counsel is using reptile tactics for my upcoming trial because he used them during deposition. Should I use the actual reptile book in my closing argument to show the jury and to tell the jury what is really going on? Oh, that's interesting. That that's that, that's interesting. You know, I had it I had it uh happen the other day where during a mock I heard where the attorney laid out the reptile theory and said this and even went as far as to say he's trying to tap into your reptile brain. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my answer 
okay, first off, my answer is no, right? Because you're not even going to describe reptile the right way because most of you folks still don't understand it. Well, I, how many yeah. po- how many podcasts do we have to do about that? Well, I think the it's, other. I mean, come on. <laughs> the other thing too is, as you and I both know, and we we have a paper coming out. Reptiles oh, yeah. dead. Oh yeah, soon. Reptiles dead. dead. It's it's dead. the edge. It's the edge now. Dead. So if you're if if you're talking about edge, the reptile. Baby. If you're talking about the reptile, no you're, you're talking, talking about reptile theory, <laughs> you're only telling plaintiff attorneys that you're not up up to snuff on the latest and the greatest. You're not, not up to speed. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's advanced. The funny thing was, I just got something in my I think I forwarded it to you about 30 days ago about the uh um one of the companies, CLE companies was offering a uh, reptile seminar. Oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. where what, hold on. I'm like, where have you people been? <laughs> yeah. Like who's putting on this reptile seminar? It's two. It's 2024. And I will tell you, you, where have you been? And I will tell you privately. <laughs> where, uh, you're late to the attorneys, party. I can tell you privately. Plaintiff attorneys laugh when people talk about that because they're because they know it's like hilarious because they know you're you're behind the eight ball. And, and We've already this. told you what to do. It's like we have the anti reptile playbook for free. It's just go to our article section. Listen to we've done what. 50 podcasts on this topic. I mean, you want to learn how to beat that. I mean, it's, it's right there. Yeah. I think the other thing too, is if if you're showing, if you're showing the book, most attorneys, most attorneys lately have been, have using motion and limines, right? So if you're using a motion and limine to stop plaintiff attorney from using it, you sure as hell aren't going to bust out the book either and start talking about it. So you probably should have preempted it in the first place. So you didn't have to get to a point or even bring it up. No, I don't think it's a good idea. I think you just beat them. Just yeah. beat them. You don't you, need to do that. To, well, you beat them. You beat them in beat deposition. Them. Beat them in deposition, and you beat them in preparation on the in, yeah. in the research. That's what you do. Not showing the jury the reptile book. Jesus, <laughs> dumb, dumb stuff. That's okay. Yeah, so, some of these are just completely idiotic, but but they're, but they're fun. They're they're fun questions. Uh, Bill, are you still getting yelled at by your wife about loading the dishwasher? Now, listen, we did a, I did, I did a rant about loading the dishwasher and how just my sons and I just get berated every day about. Uh, so here's the answer to the question is no, I'm not getting yelled at anymore. Do you want to know why? Okay, because here's what I do. I put the silverware in the dishwasher because you cannot screw that up. There's no way to screw that up. Okay, but if I have bowls or plates, I just wash them by hand. Smart. She comes in. She's like, "What are you doing?" I go, "I'm, I'm washing dishes." She goes, "Well, we have a dishwasher." I go, ah, ah, "See, the trap's been set, Steve. <laughs> I'm not falling into the trap again." I go, "I know, but I don't want to get you know my ass handed to me by you for loading it wrong. Therefore, I'm going to wash this plate by hand, put it on the other side to dry, and then I'll put it away later." And she goes, "Well, that's you know that's dumb." We have a dishwasher. If you just use it right, we wouldn't have this issue. I said, well, that's where the disagreement is. That's where the dis it's the bowl, Steve, the bowl, the, the bowls, these bowls don't fit in the dish. The slots don't make, no. The, and the bowls come in different shapes and sizes. The plates are, yeah, you can't screw up the plates. really. It's the bowls in the dishwasher. It just, you go right to divorce court with us. I'm telling you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you found what a you think about solution. This? I think it's a good idea. Hey, I, I, I hand wash sometimes too, just to, to make everything my life easier. Just I don't want to, I don't I don't want the issues. Um the rest of these questions are pretty funny. Um uh, uh, uh Bill and Steve, I really enjoyed your chicken wings episode. Remember I did the rant on the cost of the price oh, of yeah, chicken yeah. wings. Uh and then we had we had the infamous blue yeah. cheese debate, right? Um outside of buffalo sauce. What are both of your favorite chicken wing sauces? I tell you what I'm addicted to right now. I just had them. I had them last night. I just had the leftovers uh, here at about noon. Uh, I'm very big on garlic parmesan. Where are you at on this? Uh, garlic parmesan is good. I'm more of like a, a sweet heat, a like Asian zing type uh, flavor. And my son's got Those me turned on to this hot mustard as well. So I like the hot mustard as well. Like the hot honey mustard. Ooh, where do you hop? You got hot mustard. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, wings and more. Ooh. I, I I had uh, my local place. I did not see that. I may have to try that. I tell you this right now. Your traditional, like the buffalo. By the way, when when I was growing up, there was only one sauce. I know what it was. Buffalo. Yeah. 
<laughs> There's mild and hot. Now you got all these, you got like a million different sauces. I can't handle the buffalo sauce anymore. I'll have indigestion for the next three, four days. It's it's brutal. Even the mild. I'm like, I can't, can't, I can't take my stomach can't take it anymore. I'm getting too old for this. Jeez. Oh. That's how you know you're getting too old when you can't eat buffalo. That's just me. Okay. Um, okay, here's um okay, here's here here's another question. I've heard this like you're just gonna laugh at this. I'm gonna throw this to you, Steve. Um I heard somewhere that um my witness should wear a blue shirt when they testify or blue blouse because it makes the there's science that says it makes them more believable. Seriously? <laughs> I I mean you really sent me this question? Real really? Steve, don't I mean I'll no, I mean, it. I think a lot of like, I, I mean, I do say blues and grays and kind of more like conservative colors well, I mean, don't, don't come in. It's not effing believable. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's more, more believable. <laughs> I, I do see a lot of these things on there that I think a lot of people get get hung up on, right? As far as your tie should be this color and your shirt should be that like, color. Like dumb know. things, dumb yeah. things. Should I wear glasses? Should I not wear glasses? Yeah. That's another big one. Should I, should I wear glasses to look more sophisticated and smarter? Will the jury? Be, I'm like, no, <laughs> be comfortable. Be. I'll tell you this. The witnesses that look most professional certainly have more believability and credibility. I'll tell you that. Yeah. But whether that's a white shirt or a gray shirt or a blue shirt, that's I mean, I, I know. Listen, I know you want to get the edge and get the advantage of your adversaries, but it's got to stop someplace. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, come on. Conservative I mean, colors, I think, just across let's, the let's, board, let's, right? Just don't wear like a pink. Conservative pink, colors, pink, right? Bright, bright pink shirt <laughs> or blouse or something. Yeah, I've seen witnesses try like do some like some really stupid things, like if it's like if the uh, trials in December, like they'll wear some like Christmassy tie on the stands. Like no, do and that. attorneys do the same. I'm like, no, do not wear the Santa Claus tie. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Don't wear, wear don't wear the uh, uh, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer uh, earrings. No, 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 I think no. Be authentic. Very, very bad. I think is the thing we've taught, we've harped on before, right? Be authentic. Be yourself. Don't be, and that's authentic. People are more believable if they know if they can tell that you're not being authentic. If they can tell you're trying to put on a show. Then you lose credibility. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, don't 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 fake it. The whole fake it till you make it that doesn't work in a courtroom. No. Okay. Maybe it works in other areas. It doesn't doesn't work in a courtroom. Uh, oh, this is this is kind of a compliment. Uh, Bill, I saw you at the speech last week. You're looking pretty jacked. Got that right. How do you do it? Well, I I lift heavy things most days of the week. I lift them until it hurts really bad. Then I stop. Then I rest for about two, three minutes. And then I, I repeat that. That's essentially what I do. But they want to know what my favorite exercise was. I have two, and I know you're a gym goer as well, Steve. Uh, and we have to on the road, right? I mean, we yeah. travel. I mean, you got you got to hit the hotel gym. Uh, my two favorite, so my upper, my upper body favorite exercise by far is the lateral, lateral dumbbell raises. Mm get to you know I, I i i've had some sore shoulders so i may only go with like 12 pounds but i could go up to 30 if depending on how how angry i am right uh but how i'm feeling that day but just the lateral raise the lateral raise with the dumbbells absolutely fantastic exercise and for a lower body and i really this is this is so important to people that sit a lot and you and i have to sit a lot on airplanes and stuff and that low back oh it's awful the um kettlebell romanian deadlift rdl the kettlebell so yeah yeah you, you spread your feet about maybe a foot apart and you have that kettlebell down there and you're going to bend your knees you're going to bend your knees and you're going to reach down grab that kettlebell and you're going to do the hip hinge right so you're not just using your lower back and when you stand up straight you're going to have your hamstrings and your glutes erect your body that takes, I mean, I have no back pain since I've started doing those. No back pain. Steve, give me your favorite upper body and favorite lower body exercise, particularly for people that travel like us. Uh, my my favorite upper body probably would just be the the normal dumbbell curls. Uh, there's something just that uh, a good, you know, pump in, Gotta your, love them. in your biceps. Gotta love them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, um, as far as lower body, God, I, love those. I tend to like to do the leg extensions, just where you're sitting down in, in the chair and, and you're extending your legs out in front of you, focusing more on, on the quads than on the hamstrings. Got to have that when you travel. Okay. Last, last question. I, and I, this, th to me, I, I think this is the best question. I think this, I saved this best for last because somebody asked me this recently. They said, uh, the question was, what are things that the defense can do that really irritates the plaintiff? Meaning from the defense team, right? Defense team versus the plaintiff team. What are things that really bother the plaintiffs? And I, I, can, I can think of two very distinct things right here. Uh, one of them is now done a lot, which is half of what we do, is when the defense takes witness prep and training really, really seriously, and these well-trained witnesses go into depth, and they are highly trained, and they know the plaintiff attorney blueprint, that absolutely drives the plaintiff's counsel nuts that would have been i mean insane one. absolutely insane they stomp out of there and these cases settle for far less because of that uh really really good witness performance but the other one that no one's talking about that no one's talking about and i heard this let's just say i heard this through the great i heard it through the grapevine okay i heard it through the grapevine okay now it has to be the right case and but here's the thing this is something the defense does that makes the plaintiff's attorney crazy but the defense doesn't like to do it. And that is knowing when to admit liability. Yeah, bingo. And, yeah, and that's fighting the cool. war on damages. Only. This drives, because all the juicy stuff is in the liability case, Steve. And when they admit liability, and now you're trying a case on damages only, who's on trial? The defendant's not on trial anymore. Yeah. The plaintiff themselves and the damages demand and the plaintiff attorney is on trial. Now, the problem is a lot of defendants are terrified of that. They're scared of that. They don't want to do that, which is another way. So we do this project, what we call test retest, right? And so we will do a focus group or a mock trial on a case on day one, and we'll fight on liability, and we'll let the jurors deliberate and talk about things, and we'll, we'll get the results. Then on day two, we admit liability. We, 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 we take a lot of those bad facts out. And then we do the mock trial again. Steve, talk a little bit about how important that analysis is. Because if you listen, oftentimes we do this, and on day one, we get hit for $50 million. And then on day two, we admit liability, and the damage just drops to 10. Why? The, the jury didn't hear all this bad stuff in the liability case. And therefore, the only thing they paid attention to was the validity of the plaintiff's injuries uh and, and economic and non-economic claims can make a huge difference right yeah you've uh uh you've touched off on a a nerve of me as it comes to this um this kind of uh -oh. area kind of uh -oh. pisses, it pisses me off um because uh oh we got yeah, this yeah so well the point being is is to your point that you're saying about we need to test it and find out whether or not you get hit for a large amount or not a large amount i think like you said, that that's a smart idea to test it, to find out, do we need admitted liability? And if we do admitted liability, what does it look like? But here's where it really irritates me is that plaintiff's bar is upset now that the defense attorneys are admitting liabilities and admitting that they made mistakes. However, yes, plaintiff attorneys are going to sit there and go, <laughs> we've presented them with all this information. And yet still, ladies and gentlemen, they won't admit fault. They don't believe they did anything wrong. But then yeah. as soon as turn and, and as soon as the defense turns around and says, Hey, you know what? We screwed up. We realize we screwed up. We're ready to take accountability. Now plaintiff attorneys are pissed at that because they know it's influ influencing their damage awards. So don't talk out of both sides of your mouth it's to try huge. to say that it's that you're 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 mad when yeah. they stipulate be and but I at know. the same time you want to hold them responsible. I know. So I think I think it's a good yeah. idea, especially so when test your case, but I gotta tell you. No, I was just gonna say I think right. it's a, I think it's a good idea. It, you know, when the when the facts are against you, I mean, how many times have we worked on cases before where we know the facts are against us, and the best thing to do is to just admit that you made mistakes. You know, and and they don't want to. Nobody wants to. In life, people don't want to. In life, people don't want to. 
And now you're going to expect them to do that in litigation. Well, I tell you what, it, it makes a big, big difference. Yeah. And um, it, it really, it really makes life difficult for a plant attorney when the, when the, when, and by the way, there are some cases where you would never admit liability. Right. Right. Or maybe it is an apportionment case and you go, yeah, you know, we're 10% to blame, not 90. Right. There, there's ways to do this, but it really does, um, I, I think, put a plant attorney in a difficult position when defense does admit liability. They take responsibility. They come across as very compassionate and authentic. And now the entire case is about damages, which then um, the, it's all the pressures on the plaintiff, not the defense anymore. Yeah. I think you did one other thing too. I want to close up on that. You talked about apportionment and stuff. I think that's another area to to talk about that you need to test as well. As far as apportionment is when you say, "Are we going to are we going to stipulate and say that we screwed up and, and let's just move past the negligence and go into damages?" But at the same time, you can talk about when there's comparative fault that you can you know mm -hmm. put some fault on yourself as well and take some percentage. But then that's another thing too where you want to test it because. If you say, yeah, we yeah. take responsibility. How many times have we seen where a company is like, yeah, we'll take responsibility, uh, 5%. And then, and then jurors are mad because yeah, they're like, like oh, 5%, on. okay. Yeah. But at the same time though, do you- How admit, convenient. Yeah. Then the same time, uh, you, you have to question, do we take 40%? Is 40% too much? So that's another thing to test much like the anchor. And if you have co-defendants, right? Mm -hmm. If you have co-defendants, well, now, now we've this. Now this is very uh, elaborate, right? Because now the plaintiff can get some responsibility. You may say if you have another couple co-defendants, that's a lot of percentages to go around. Versus if it's one defendant, one plaintiff, that's very different. So yeah, test your cases, ladies and gentlemen. All right, I think that concludes Vera Mail. Steve, thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, 2024. I want yeah, I really want going to war in 24. That's, that's the right. way. I like that's it. My attitude. Maybe we'll this. get we'll get uh, and, um, get slogan shirts with CSI branding on it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. But thank you to um, all of our audience members. Uh, um, this is great. I get again. I get contacted every week about this podcast, and people. Um, really, really like it. They find it valuable. We enjoy doing it. So, yeah. uh, Steve, take us out, and we're gonna wrap up here. The first episode of 2024. Yes, as I say again, I always appreciate, truly, truly appreciate all the feedback, all the all the listeners, all the the viewers and stuff, and, and the good the uh, good comments that we get. So, um, I'm I'm really appreciative of that. Anyway, as always, go to courtroomsciences.com. All of our blogs, podcasts, articles, those are all up there. You know, feel free to reach out to Bill or myself on our emails or cell phones. Um, but this has been another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences.